Hey, Tim. I told you I'd be here. I didn't expect there would only be two people. Well, happy holidays. The same to you. How's everything? Ah, good. Just getting things kind of settled and the family's coming down for the holidays. So getting everything ready. Where are you? Where are you? I'm back at Stanford, but I was in Boston and New York uh, this weekend. Okay, nice. Yeah, I was I was following the, the food. <laughs> yeah, so it's like a, I always eat too much when I'm in New York. There are worse fates. <laughs> yeah. How long are you in California? Um, uh, um, until February. Yeah. Okay. Oh, nice. My whole family got COVID in China, so they're all coming back this week. Oh, no. But everyone in China got COVID. Yeah, fair point. How are they feeling? Uh, they're okay. Yeah. Yeah, here, it seems like here everybody's getting flu now. I see. Because we had, we were supposed to have seminar tomorrow, but our speaker was coming over from U Sciences and uh, came down with flu. Oh, okay. Hi, Tongwei. Hi, Aaron. Good to see you. Good to see you. Long time no see. <laughs> um, do you want to test out your slides? Sure. Uh, so, which of us is uh, starting? Pardon? Am I starting first? Uh, you're second. Okay. Hi. Hi, Hal. Thanks so much. Hi, Hal. Hi, hello. Good to see you. Uh, how, how do I pronounce your name? Uh, to, is it Tong Wei? Tong Wei, yes. It's so nice meeting you. Nice meeting you. So, so it's quite okay. okay. Share. Yeah, looks good. Um, how do you want to test out your slide? Yeah, for sure. Thanks. Let's see. Um, here we go. Share the screen. Uh, okay. Oops. Did uh, did it work? Yeah, yes. that's good. Yeah. Okay. Wait. Okay, okay. So it's advancing and and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, do I go first or uh yeah. Okay, sounds good. Thanks for agreeing to do this. Oh yeah, no, it's not, no worries. Uh, thanks so much for inviting. It's a you know it's a great opportunity. I I, I actually actually been following the the similar theory for uh, you know quite a long time, oh, and cool. I'm pretty honored honored to um to be invited to be us. Oh great, thanks. Yeah, be good. What department are you going to be in? Um, in Northwestern. I'll be in the psychiatry department, psychiatry oh, okay. and behavioral sciences. Is that in uh, the in Chicago or Evanston? Yeah, yeah, in Chicago. Okay. In the in the medical campus. Okay, got it, got it. Cool. Are you there now, or you're in California? No, I'm still uh, in 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 Case Lab in San Diego. Oh, good. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah enjoying the last good weather here be before jumping into the snow. Yeah. I'm still tracking her. She's she's been tough to try to get to give one of these talks. But um, I'm persistent. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Well, I'm sure. Like, did you copy Olivia? I mean, I can send um the admin's email because um, Kate doesn't really check her email. It's all like you know, her admin like report back. You know, what are the things that she should do? Yeah, I tried all those. I mean, yeah, I, I tried all those different things. Hey, Zilong. Oh, yeah. 
Hai, nice to meet you, Tulong. Nice to meet you, Tulong. It's hard to hear you, Tulong. Oh, maybe your internet's... Oh, it was just hard to hear you. Is your microphone not working, Tulong? We can't hear you. Hi, oh. oh, she has the NeuroZoom hoodie on. Aaron, I was wearing the maroon one today and somebody thought I looked like Santa Claus. That might not have to do with the hoodie, but maybe. Oh, because it's like white and red, white and red. Yeah, yeah. that's fair. <laughs> it's pretty soft and comfortable. It's fantastic. I'm. We're going to try and get Moscow Lab hoodies, uh, and we're going to use that one as the base. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Did any of those hoodies reach Taiwan yet? Shunru? Any? I, I don't know. Oh, okay. Check your mail. <laughs> okay. Did you send it? Maybe. <laughs> cool. So you guys were both at Baylor together? Yeah. Okay. She's a couple of years uh, be, uh, there before I did went there. Oh, okay. She was older or a uh, higher class. Not older. Not yes. older. Not, not older. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> She's always younger. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Hi, it's long. You're back. Yeah, I think your microphone's not working so long. Hi, Jen. Hi, Hi, hi. Hi, Colleen. How's the Singapore? Good seeing you. Good. Good. good see you. Yeah, I know. So the last time we saw each other is uh, right before pandemic. <laughs> yeah. It was fortunate you, you were able to visit just before. Yeah. Long time. It's good seeing you. Wow, Aaron, you're definitely diehard for holidays. Yeah. <laughs> I 
Yeah, so everyone in my family got COVID in China. Everyone. Yeah. Hmm. But they all recovered. Yeah. Yeah. Good. That's what there. There's a internet saying: seven days, everybody recover. Yeah, I guess the problem is everyone doesn't get it at the same time. Oh, yeah. So it's um, they're coming back. Yeah, this week. That's a good thing. Yeah. We are small enough to say happy holidays to everyone. <laughs> oh, happy holidays. I just don't know how many people. Yeah, we can. Well, this will be like a group meeting. Yeah, actually, this is much better. Stanford has a uh, winter closure. I don't know if USD has that. We do. We do. Starting. That's why everything we're watching. Um, I've been trying to discourage my lab from following that. It's the university saving energy, saving money. Yeah. Saving a lot of things. When do, you, when do you close? Okay, everybody. Oh, yeah, hey, Berkeley closed too, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> Jeff. <laughs> yeah, right. So I should put on my uh, new new. Yeah, I, I'm still on. I'm still on hoodie 1.0. Right, <laughs> new hoodie with a color holiday color. Yeah. Yeah. Don, you're, you're going to get yours in the second wave. Yeah, I know. I know. I know you have priorities here. <laughs> no, it's only because we have a very good delivery person. There, she is. Ching. Hi, Ching. Let, you, let, Hi, let's see everyone. if we can find a common a common feature of the folks that have the new Rosen hoodies. Yeah. <laughs> All great, great she speakers. Delivered. Wait, yeah. Shenru, Shenru has the old one, though. You need to get Shenru a new one. Hmm. There's a shipment going to Taiwan right now. Uh -huh. Not not a personal delivery. Um, alas, no. You hadn't thought of that, had you? No. Long, are you okay? Yeah, are you okay? <laughs> uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm trying to connect in my internet in new home. It's just so weird. So, it's just pain in the ass. Um, can you hear me still? Yeah, yeah, it's good. It's good. You could? Cool? Oh, great, great, great. Okay. Yeah, I, I still see some very, I, I couldn't see the, the guys. Do you still have a fever? Uh, yeah, no, no, I'm I'm getting over the fever. Okay. I still, uh, Get like fifty percent working for us ready, and they need a couple of days to recover. I just should be fine. Okay, I get my full energy back uh, over this weekend. I guess. Okay. So, how about people in your lab? Can they still go to work? No, I I guess not. They, they well, most of them eighty percent yes they stay at home. How about Muming uh, this week? How's Muming? More important. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, I have to ask. Um, he, he got the vaccine. I guess he's he fine. He's been in Hong Kong the, the last month. He might okay. get the vaccine there. So, yeah. I guess. Yeah, they have they have the vaccines there in Hong Kong, right? So, yeah, I guess, right? But I, I thought that they allow BNT. No. No. Oh, just yeah, foreigners. Yeah. Just for no. foreigners. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So it has some funny rules. All right. Yeah. <laughs> We're starting. I don't think. Yeah. Okay. Um good to see everyone. This is the core core group of diehard NeuroZoom fans. And it's the season finale of NeuroZoom. It's great to see everyone. And um looking forward to awesome talks. And um, we're going to take um, next week and the week after off for, for the holidays. So a good time to rest and rejuvenate. And then we'll be back with great talks in January. So uh, tell your colleagues to sign up to give talks, students, postdocs, PIs.
looking forward to hearing great science for the year to come. Okay, um, so long. Are you able to introduce uh, Hal? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, it's my uh, great pleasure to use the uh, Dr. Hao Li, uh, who is a fresh uh, assistant professor in Northwestern University. So Hao is uh, graduates from uh, Shandong University has bachelor degree, and after after master degree in in uh, uh, South Dakota and a PhD in Medical University of South Carolina. Uh, how worked with K Tai in Sock University, and recently has beautiful work in the, in the um, valence assignment, and in his new lab, I believe something more interesting will be going on. Uh, today, uh, I guess how we'll talk about more, mainly his uh, postdoc work, the role of neurotensin in the uh, valence assignment. Okay, uh, welcome, Hao. All right, thanks so much. Um, thanks so much for inviting me and this nice introduction. Um, are you guys seeing the my my slides? Um, is it coming out okay? Looks good. All right, awesome. So um, like, like I said, I'm honored to be here today, and um, I'm very excited to talk about my uh, postdoc work, um, which is on the role of neurotensin in valence assignment. So essentially, you know, while we are experiencing the world around us, we're constantly bombarded by sensory stimuli. And our brain must rapidly filter out the important information and determine whether something is good or bad in order to make an optimal decision for our survival. So valence assignment is one of the essential neural mechanisms that um, our brain uses to assign either a positive or negative value to a given stimulus. So, um, wait, it's not, ad wait, it's advancing. Okay, here we go. Um, okay, so in a very simplified framework, uh, when the stimuli is presented, the brain will first determine whether it's important or not. So if the stimulus is important, we'll then further evaluate how good it is, then it can make a decision whether to approach or um, avoid this stimulus. So for example, for an ice cream to be appetitive and for a hammer to be aversive, our brain have to assign an, a value based on the, our previous experience. So essentially, this process of assigning specific va valence or value to a neutral stimulus is called valence assignment. And many studies, have, of course, I'm showing that the disruptions in this process can lead to many forms of mental health disorders, um, such, uh, including substance use disorders, anxiety disorders, and depression. So it's very important for us to understand the uh, underlying neural mechanisms so that we can better develop a treatment for these uh, valence-related uh, disorders. So in, in lab, one of the most commonly used behavior model to study valence assignment is associative learning or Pavlovian conditioning, where animals um, learn uh, or receive an unconditioned stimulus, usually an auditory tone, followed by an unconditioned stimulus, which is either a sucrose reward or a foot shock punishment. And after a certain number of conditions, animals will learn that the um, presentation of the tone is predictive of either um, uh, it's, it's predictive of either a positive or negative outcome. So, so from now on, I will uh, refer the conditioned stimulus as CS and unconditioned stimulus as US. The key region that mediates the valence assignment or associated learning is um, the beta lateral amygdala, which is, is a uh, functionally conserved brain regions across multiple species. And it's been shown that BRV neurons receive inputs from cort cortex and thalamus that carries the sensory and um, context-related information. And following associative learning, we see that um, synaptic, synaptic potentiations into the BRE neurons and also increased um, firing rate um, to both positive and negative outcomes. However, you know, if you really think about this relationship between the collective conditioning task and the BRE neural activity, there's something that doesn't actually quite match, right? Because while we know that the, the US uh, often occur many seconds after the, the starting of the CS, we see the BLA neurons have these very, very fast, fast and phasic excitations at the onset of the CS and the onset of US. So, so, the, so, so, so the question is, how does the BLA neurons that show this phasic activation binds the information between the CS and the US that, that, uh, that are tens of seconds apart? So in another words, how is the plasticity developed at the behavior-relevant time scale? So it's, uh, it's, um, essentially, 
we know that the classic Hybian plasticities operate at a millisecond time scale, and the, and the uh, dendritic calcium spikes and also sub sub seconds. So none of these um, 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 mechanisms is able to or uh, sufficiently explain the plasticity occur between um, two stimulus that are seconds apart. So one possible mechanism is through a G protein mediated uh, 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 G protein coupled receptor signaling or GPCRs. Uh, which has been shown to uh, largely involved in many motivated behaviors and also mod uh, modulate sampling transmissions and pl uh, plasticity at a longer time scale. So essentially this leads to my uh, today's talk on exploring how neurotensin as a neuropeptide can orchestrate venous assignment by extending, extending behavior, time re uh, behavior relevant time windows during associative learning. So works from our lab and others have previously demonstrated that the BRE neurons um, the two BLA projection populations that have opposing rules during social learning. So we found that the BLA neurons that project to the nucleus common or NSC preferentially encodes the word, and the neurons that project to the central nucleus of amygdala or CEM preferentially encodes punishment. Specifically, um, we see that after reward learning, uh, we see a stamping potentiations onto the NSC projectors, and following punishment learning, we see a stamping potentiations onto the CEM uh, projections. And also, after genetic manipulation of these two projection populations can selectively drive approach or avoidance behavior. So even if the downstream targets are sort of hardware to produce either approach or avoidance behavior, we still have little mechanistic understanding um, about how valence is assigned during learning. So specifically, how do the inputs know which downstream projections to potentiate in a valence specific manner? Um, using RNA sequencing, we have previously identified a uh, neuropeptide GPCR, which is a neurotensin receptor type 1 um, genes, uh, which is, is enriched into CEM projectors compared to the NAC projectors. Um, this actually leads to our hypothesis that uh, neurotensin is able to guide the valence assignment into the appropriate BLA downstream projections during associative learning. So the first question uh, we asked um, was how does the uh, neurotensin is it able to modulate uh, the inputs coming onto the BLA projections? So, so to get this question, we essentially um, use a activable patch clamp combined with reservoir tracing. Uh, uh, for example, uh, here we use RetroBees. And we, we selectively recorded uh, EPSCs onto the NSC and the CEM projectors um, and see how the neurotensin affect these um, uh, uh, um, uh, stimuli in these EPSCs. So the way that we did it is we, we record the EPSCs um, during the baseline period uh, where we um, BAS applied the ACSF, and then we add the neurotensin to the BAS. And we found that a 10 nanomol of neurotensin is able to enhance EPSCs induced onto the NSC projectors and suppress EPSCs induced onto the CEM projectors. And then when we BAS applied the neurotensin receptor one antagonist and then apply for neurotensin, we see that the neurotensin induced effect onto these two projection populations were completely blocked by the NTNS1 antagonist, uh, indicating that um, neurotensin uh, um, is able to produce this uh, bidirectional or, or a bidirectional effect onto these uh, two BLA projection populations, and the effect of neurotensin are completely dependent on the neurotensin receptor type 1. And so now we know that neurotensin is able to differentially modulate the, the, the glutamate transmission on these projection populations. We next want to know what are the inputs of a neurotensin source to the BLA. And uh, for the sake of time, uh, we, I'm just gonna show you that we found the um, three upstream source of neurotensin um, to the BLA, which are medial geniculus nucleus, MGN, ventral hippocampus, VHPC, and the paraventricular nucleus of thalamus, PVT. And we also found this, all these three neurotensin source um, is able to co-release glutamate along with neurotensin. So, um, so here we, um, we're gonna focus on to this PVT to BLA projections. Um, the reason is that uh, we, uh, people have shown that the PVT, uh, which is uh, midline, mid, uh, midline thalamic uh, regions have been shown to have a lot of uh, heterogeneity functions in mediating both positive and negative valence. So first uh, we wanted to um, selectively interrogate the PVT to BLA neurotensin projections um, in vivo during uh, animals are learning either positive and negative um, uh, association. So however, the first challenge we had was 
how to isolate the neurotensin contribution from the glutamate or from the co-release glutamate. Because we know um, typical optogenetic and uh, chemogenetic approach is, is able, it's, it's great for uh, behavior motivation, but they don't actually differentiate um, what's uh, either glutamate or neurotensin. They, they just essentially knock uh, or activate or enhance the activity of this projection. So to, to selectively isolate the neurotensin from the co-release glutamate, we essentially uh, collaborate with Dr. Xin Jin and Feng Zhang um, to develop this um, CRISPR-Cas9 approach to selectively knock down the neurotensin in this PVT to BLA projections. So essentially, uh, we inject the, we, we package the neurotensin guide RNAs into a virtual AAV and inject in the BLA, and they, the guide RNAs will tr back transport it to the, uh, to the PVT where we inject the uh, the Cas9 protein, or, or I mean Cas9 virus. So this this will will reduce uh, induce a pathway specific neurotensin knockout. You see that um, only the neurons that containing guide RNAs is able to or um, show this dramatic neurotensin knockout um, without affect, affecting glutamate. Uh, for the control group where we inject a scramble and um, guide RNAs have no effect on the neurotensin MRAs uh, nor uh, the BGL2 MRAs. And as a comparison, we also conduct a gain of function manipulation where we optogenetically activate the PVT to BLA and neurotensin terminals. So we first conducted these um, uh, surgeries, and after the, the virus has expressed, and the, um, we train the mice in this um, pavlovian conditioning task, where they first learn um, to associate one auditory tone paired with the sucrose reward, and followed by a punishment learning task where they uh, associate a different auditory tone paired with a mild shock. And we see that neurotensin now caught in the PVT to BLA projections as uh, able to suppress the um, reward learning indicated by the poor injury probabilities in response to the auditory tone. And at the same time, they increase the uh, punishment learning, which is indicated by a uh, time spent in freezing in response to the uh, shock predictive tone. Consistently, when we look at the gain of function manipulation, we see optogenetic activation of this, this projection promote reward learning and surprise the punishment learning, which is the uh, opposite behavior effect uh, we got from the loss of function manipulation. So to summarize this part, we essentially found that when we activate this projection, we're able to drive the behavior towards more reward learning, which is consistent that um, the increase of neurotensin concentration drives NAC projectors, which uh, drive the reward and suppress uh, the CEM projectors. And presumably when we knock out the, uh, the neurotensin from this, this projection, when we decrease the, the neurotensin activity of this projection, we drive the um, behavior towards more punishment learning. So we know that when we artificially manipulating the neurotensin concentration in the BLA, we were able to get this um, very nice behavior outcome. But how do neurotensin dynamics in the BLA normally respond to learning? So to get this question, we essentially um, record the, the, um, record the um, neurotensin dynamics using fibrotometry in a half fixed preparation. And here again, uh, the mice were trained uh, with a one tone paired with sucrose, another tone paired with uh, air puff as a punishment. So we first look at the uh, calcium activities of PET to BLA neurotensin projections during social learning. So here we inject a, a GCAM6, which is a calcium indicator um, into the PVT neurotensin cream mice and implant the fiber into the BLA. So essentially we're uh, recording the terminal calcium act act activities as a proxy of the PVT to BLA neurotensin uh, projection. And again, we train the mice with four sessions of reward learning and followed by two sessions of punishment learning. And here we essentially compared um, the uh, calcium activity before and after animals have acquired this association. And we see, we, we see that after animals have acquired this tone sucrose association, we see um, an increase the calcium activities compared uh, in, during the late acquisition session compared to the early acquisition session, indicating that reward learning increased activity of this projection. And in contrast, we see a decreased calcium activity of this projection after following um, tone air puff association indicating the punishment learning suppressed activity of this PVT to BLA neurotensin projections. But one caveat of calcium activity is that they reflect both glutamate and neurotensin release, 
So to selectively monitor the neural tensor dynamics in vivo, we uh, team up with the uh, Yulong Lee's lab on developing and validating this uh, neural tensor grab sensor. Essentially, the sensor is based on the human uh, anti anti one proteins, and, and when neural tensor binds with the, uh, the sensor, it makes a conformational change and activate the GFP proteins. And we validate that the sensor is highly selective and highly sensitive for neural tensor. So then we ex essentially express this, uh, this, this sensor into the BLA. And again, uh, train the mice in four sessions of reward learning and followed by two sessions of punishment learning. And, co and consistent to um, the learning induced changes in the calcium activities, we see that reward learning essentially increased the calcium, I mean, uh, neural tensor release into the BLA um, when we compare the late acquisition session to the early acquisition session. And similarly, the punch learning uh, further surprised the neural tension release uh, into the BLA, which is consistent with the learning induced changes in um, uh, that we see from the uh, our terminal photometry. So to summarize this part, uh, we essentially found that the neural tension is released in the BLA in the valence specific manner. Essentially, during reward learning, we see that um, the increase in neural neuro, neuro tension. Uh, release into BLA, which is consistent with optogenetic activation, drives reward learning. And punch learning um, suppresses the neurotensin release into the BLA, essentially decrease the neurotensin concentration, and which is consistent with the uh, neurotensin knockout, um, promotes punch learning. So finally, uh, we wanted to know how the neurotensin is able to mediate the BLA neurodynamics in, in vivo. So to answer these questions, we, um, we essentially record the BLA neural activities using in vivo recordings uh, with ability to photo tag either NAC or CEA uh, neurons. And half the animals are receive um, the crystal renal count from PVT to neural tensor. Essentially, we're, ask, ask, we're asking um, what the BLA neuron, uh, how the BLA neural response with or without neural tensor release from the PVT. Essentially, animals were first trained with Pavlovian conditioning task and record this in this 3Q discrimination task where um, three auditory tones pair uh, is predictive of either sucrose with um, no outcome as, you, as the neutral cue and a, a mild, mild shock. Essentially, we record the BLA neural activities uh, in response to three uh, different trial types. So um, first we look at how neural tension affect BLA neural response at the population level. So essentially, we capture the population dynamics by pulling all the recorded neurons and perform a dimensionality re reduction using a principal component analysis. And we visualize the uh, dynamics of a response to all three CSS by plotting the uh, first two principal components as the neural trajectories. So essentially, the neural trajectory is uh, reflecting the uh, dynamics of the in the data set as a function of time. So here, I'm plotting one second before and one second after the onset of, of CS. And what you're seeing now here is how the neural dynamics changed across two seconds of time. And so as you can see that their trajectory um, started to diverge, I mean, diverge as soon as the, the CS is, is played, suggesting that BLA neurons uh, as a population responds differently to three different um, CSs. And the um, total distance of this tra tra trajectory is, in, is um, indicate the amount of dynamics in this given time. So here, what you're seeing now is the trajectory for control mice, and here's the trajectory for CRISPR mice. You can clearly see that the, the, the CRISPR tra trajectory is dramatically shriveled compared to the control, which is also uh, seen in the total length of trajectories and also the total distance um, between CS um, reward and CS shock. And next, we wondered um, whether the neural test could affect the particular BLA ensembles. So to identify the uh, different BLA ensembles, we perform this hierarchical clustering um, method, which is a supervised cluster, clustering method, um, grouping neurons um, based on their similarity in, in response. So using this method, we we're able to classify three, uh, seven different clusters um, based on their response to these three different types of CS. And you see that for control mice, um, cluster one and cluster three basically uh, re reflecting the um, positive, positive valence encoding patterns where they have a strong response to sucrose uh, CS and a weaker response to uh, food shock CS. And cluster four and cluster two are re re uh, reflective of negative valence encoding neurons, which are, they have more stronger response to uh, shock CS compared to reward CS. 
And you see that um, in, in near tensor now called mice, the near tensor now called A42 uh, dramatically or significantly attenuate the CH response selectively in these valence encoding clusters from one, one two, three, four, and indicating that there are neural tensors have a you know have a um, selective effect on on these valence encoding um, BLA ensembles. And consistently, when we look at the um, projection specific populations, where we identify these uh, in, the, in the either their NAC or CA projecting neurons by their short photoresponse photo latency. And similarly, we see that the neural sense down count reduce the uh, CS response um, to both um, NS, either NAC or CA uh, projections. So here we see, uh, so, so in summary, we see um, we, um, the neural sense down count is able to dramatically decrease the CS response to both uh, reward and shock CS. We next ask whether the neural test now cause also affect BLA neural encodings. So here we use um, a support vector or ICVM, or it's a uh, which is a linear decoder to predict um, the, uh, whether the current trial, trial type is sucrose or shock or shock trial based on the single trial act activity. And we found that uh, when we train and test the, deco the decoder on the, uh, on the same group, we see uh, surprisingly both control and CRISPR mice is able to decode the trial type just fine. However, when we train and test on the opposite group, we see that when we train on control mice and test on CRISPR mice, we see that decoding um, accuracies will dramatically decrease. So, so, so this asymmetry suggests that a classifier trained on the uh, coding principles of the control animals was not able to decode the muted signal from the CRISPR treated mice, indicating an alteration in the um, valence encoding principles of BLA neurons induced by neural tensor now code. So to further test this idea, we um, go back to our behavior and develop this unsupervised behavior classification method based on the post estimation algorithm. So essentially, just, just like a developed cut or, or sleep, we uh, label the frames uh, using these algorithms and then uh, extract behavior uh, measurement and then uh, embedded these uh, behavior features into a testing space. And in our discrimination task, we see um, in sucrose trial, we can separate the, these into a seven um, behavior clusters and a five behavior cluster for shock trials. And interestingly, when we map our behavior feature back onto these um, on, onto this testing plot, we see these um, clusters are roughly correlated with whether animals are being passive or active. Um, so for example, during the sucrose trial, a passive trial is basically indicating of a reward approaching behavior where animals hear the tone and run to the port to collect the reward. In contrast, um, passive trial indicating a reward anticipation behavior where basically animals wait by the port, constantly checking the port, the, the reward delivery when um, before the tone is even played. And similarly for shock group or, or for shock trials and active trials um, is indicating an escaping or darting behaviors when animal hears the tone, they're trying to, you know, trying to escape. And the passive trials indicating a freezing behavior where animals uh, stay freezing for the entirety of the shock CS. And when we quantify this, we see that in control mice, they prefer to use this um, passive or active behavior strategies in both sucrose and shock trials. And neurosense now called essentially impair these Q driven active behavior uh, strategies, where they ba apparently based on to the uh, back to the uh, chance level. So, to, to summarize this part, uh, we found that um, the neurosense actually is able to broadly enhance the valence assignment in the BRA neurons and also promote these active behavior strategies. So, to, to summarize, um, we found that the neurosense as a key modulator that is able to synergize with the existing glimetergic inputs and amplify the valence assignment into uh, to the proper BLB neurons in a dose-dependent manner. Um, essentially, uh, we see an increase in this projection during reward learning that activate the uh, NAC project or re reward and downvotes. And during the punish learning, the these projections were um, inhibited and therefore decreased neural tension concentration in, in the BLA therefore um, drives more punishment coding uh, neurons. So uh, with this, I would like to thank um, my incredible PI, uh, Kate Tai, and also everyone uh, in Case Lab. 
um, there uh, and our uh, amazing collaborators. Um, it's a collective work from all these people. Um, we can I cannot do any of this without any of, um, without all, all the help from um, our 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 lab members and our collaborators, and uh, of course from without K. And at the end, I just a shout out. I'm starting my lab in 2023 uh, in the spring in Northwestern, and we're hiring in the O level. So if so if you're interested in, um, please reach out. And with this, I would like to uh, take any questions. Great. Thanks to Hal. Beautiful, beautiful talk. Now, a few more questions. Uh, I might start first one at all. So it's amazing. So, it, so we just be suggesting so the input from PVT, uh, we have some modulated rule in regulating uh, valence assignments. So how how is how the PVT is involved involved? I'm curious. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a great question, right? Because the PVT has basically set in this uh, midline dynamic region that were basically received inputs from uh, cortical regions and it's able to project to the downstream of subcortical, you know, sub subcortical regions. So it's been proposed as a, a relay regions between, you know, cortex or, or thalamus. Um, so, you know, it's possible that PPT is getting the information about the U.S. where, you know, how, in, you know, the intensity of the reward or whether it's reward or it's a, or it's a punishment. And I guess, you know, the further experiment will be basically testing out how the inputs were, how, how different inputs that come into the PPT is able to modulate a, a potentially different aspect um, during the reward learning or punishment learning. Maybe some input will modulate the tone, some input will modulate reward, some input will modulate the, the punishment, or maybe a different input can modulate um, different sensory modalities that encode by 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 the uh, by the by the, by the PBT. So you know these are all the unanswered questions. Great. Do you do you know how how many uh, percentage of the uh, uh, neural tension uh, uh, projecting? Neural in PVT, approximately. Well, I think um, there are roughly twenty to thirty percent neurons in the PVT, and these neurons are also projecting to uh, nucleus accumbens and the central nucleus of amygdala. So, I mean, there's also um, likely to be some. Um, Thanks. Um, co 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 More questions. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Okay, all set. So, long. okay, great. Thank you. Right, thanks, thanks. Great thanks talk. So much. Good Thank luck. you. Good luck. Thank you. Good luck. Appreciate it. Thank you. Enjoy. Okay, uh, great talk, Hao. And now it's a uh, great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Tongwei Ko. He's a principal investigator at the Tamasic Life Sciences Laboratory in. Singapore. And uh, Tongwei received his bachelor's degree and his uh, master's degree at um, National University of uh, Singapore. Um, and then he did his PhD training at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. And here he participated in, um, in a major uh, uh, four genetic screen in Drosophila in the laboratory of uh, Hugo Bellin, and here he discovered uh, mutants that have defects in neuro uh, neurotransmission, uh, clone the genes, characterize the functions of dynamin and scaffold proteins. He continued working under Sofla where uh, for his postdoctoral fellowship, and he moved to uh, Yale University and worked with Dr. John Carlson. And here he uh, characterized a large family family of uh, taste. Uh, 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 taste receptors, the ionotropic uh, receptor superfamily, and he characterized, um, uh, they have dozens of members, he characterized them, and then uh, curiously, he discovered um, a subset of them that were expressed in, um, in a sexually dimorphic manner in neurons of the male leg, and um, these sensory neurons arouse male sexual behavior when they sense, uh, when they rub into females and sense their, their pheromones. 
uh, based on this work, he launched his uh, own laboratory back in, in Singapore, and he's been expanding his interest to include neurodegeneration. And um, I first got to know um, Tong Wei by his exciting work on alpha synuclein and genetic screens. Um, I've been doing them in yeast and just imagining someone to try to do them in, in a whole animal. And he's, he's been getting great results with those. So we're looking forward to hearing an hearing, uh, uh, update on this exciting screen, Tong Wei. Thank you, Aaron, for the very nice introduction. And I'd like to thank uh, uh, Aaron and Zilong for the opportunity to speak here and uh, Chi Ying for nominating me. Uh, so uh, my talk is uh, about our uh, project uh, to discover uh, modifiers of uh, alpha synuclein in a fly model. So uh, Many of you would have uh, known something about uh, Parkinson's disease. It's a neurological disorder that uh, uh, is best characterized by its motor center, uh, like uh, slow movement, tremor, and rigidity. At the time of uh, diagnosis, 30% uh, of the dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra would have uh, been dead. Uh, it has a very long uh, predicted uh, incubation period of uh, decades and it progressed for uh, quite a bit of time to eventually, uh, many patients eventually develop uh, dementia, uh, psychosis, and many other symptoms. So it's a multifactorial uh, disease with uh, contributions from aging, genes, and environment. In particular, uh, one gene is, uh, plays a central role in uh, Parkinson's disease. Uh, this gene is SNCA, it encodes alpha-synuclein. Uh, alpha-synuclein is the major protein constituents of uh, protein aggregates called uh, Lewy body found in uh, the affected neurons in PD brains. And almost at the same time when uh, the Lewy bodies uh, were discovered to contain alpha-synuclein, uh, uh, the gene was uh, found to be mutated in families uh, that uh, show familiar form of uh, Parkinson's disease. Uh, however, in most of uh, Parkinson's disease, it's actually uh, sporadic, as in uh, people, uh, it doesn't run in families. So when people use the GWAS approach to characterize the genetic architecture, they found that uh, the alpha synuclein gene, SNCA, uh, is one of the most strongly associated with uh, sporadic uh, Parkinson's disease. So our hypothesis is that um, uh, for especially for Parkin, uh, sporadic Parkinson disease, the pro-disease uh, variants of uh, SNCA alone uh, do not uh, contribute enough to uh, cause the disease at high penetrance. Uh, instead, there are many other pro-disease variants, uh, let's suppose gene X, and say these gene X and uh, may come together with pro-disease variants of SNCA to cause uh, synuclein uh, neuropathy, uh, such as Parkinson's disease. So uh, we are certainly not the first one who uh, uh, went into testing such a uh, hypothesis. Uh, many others uh, have done that before us, and we are certainly uh, standing on the shoulders of giants. However, one thing that inspired us to uh, get into this uh, genetic modifier screen is that um, of uh, this long list, uh, which is not exhaustive, and I have certainly failed to acknowledge many people in the field, uh, in each of these screens, uh, you are almost guaranteed to find new genes. Uh, and that suggests to us that uh, we are certainly far from fully understanding the pathways that uh, either inhibit or uh, accentuate uh, Parkinson's disease. So in our screen, uh, we created uh, 3,000 plus lines of uh, fly mutants. We combined them with uh, transgenes uh, expressing alpha synuclein in uh, flies, neurons. And initially, we uh, did a uh, climbing assay to assess for age dependent locomotor decline uh, by tapping down the flies and then quantifying how far they climb in five seconds. And then uh, when we got down to 41 lines, uh, we use uh, brain sectioning to look at uh, neurodegeneration at the 
morphological level. And then we map the genes and we did genetic rescue, phenocopying using RNAi and additional values. That got us down to 12 genes. So among these 12 genes, uh, all of them have uh, human orthologs. And uh, almost all of them uh, have human orthologs that are associated with diseases. Most uh, interestingly, uh, two of the genes uh, are, have human orthologs that are located close to PD GWAS uh, variants. Uh, these are MAT13 and CDC27. So we decided to focus on MAT13. The fly mutant that we got uh, has got a, a proline to reducing uh, substitution in a, a conserved domain. Um, and in human, the MAT13 gene lie in uh, clusters of uh, SNPs that are uh, significantly associated with Parkinson's disease. So what does uh, MAT13 uh, do? So it is a member of the uh, 30 odd uh, uh, subunit uh, mediator complex, uh, but it is not part of the core mediator complex, it's part of a four member kinase module that can come on and off the mediator complex. So the mediator complex uh, in general forms a bridge between transcription factors and the RNA polymerase to uh, machinery. So uh, I'll go into our characterization of the mutant in flies. So this is the uh, data showing the climbing assay uh, in uh, three week old flies. So this is the age that we picked uh, to where alpha synuclein uh, expressing flies have not yet started uh, showing local motor decline. So we wanted to use this as a sensitized uh, period to see what happens when we add uh, flies with uh, loss of one copy of MAT13 mutation. So if we take out one copy of MAT13 uh, gene without alpha synuclein, there's no difference in climbing height. And there's no difference in uh, climbing height when we express alpha synuclein at this age, but uh, in later ages, uh, alpha synuclein does uh, uh, cause mo locomotive decline. However, when we combine alpha synuclein and uh, losing one copy of uh, MAT13, we have uh, locomotor decline. So this uh, suggests that there's synergistic interaction between MAT13 and alpha synuclein expression. So then we examine I mean, uh, morphological uh, neurodegeneration uh, using the retina system. Here we are expressing alpha synuclein only in photoreceptor neurons that project to the uh, first neuropil, uh, the lamina. And we are seeing the lamina uh, morphology here. With uh, alpha synuclein expression, there's very few holes in the lamina compared to no alpha synuclein. And when we combine alpha synuclein with one copy of uh, a MAT13 uh, allele, we have more holes, and another uh, MAT13 allele uh, also uh, combines with alpha synuclein to show more holes. In contrast, uh, there is no holes uh, when we just have the MAT13 heterozygous mutation without alpha synuclein expression. So this, again, uh, is consistent with a synergistic interaction between MAT13 and alpha synuclein. So one row of uh, the uh, methadine containing kinase module is that it is required uh, for the transcriptional extension uh, at uh, many glycolytic uh, enzyme genes. So we decided to test whether glycolytic enzymes expression are affected uh, when we knock down uh, MAT13, and also when we uh, express uh, alpha synuclein. So what we see here is uh, knocking down uh, MAT13 does not affect alpha synuclein uh, expression itself. Uh, so, so our uh, so we can be sure that uh, this is not a artifact of uh, uh, MAT13 uh, affecting alpha synuclein expression. So in contrast, uh, expression of uh, alpha synuclein causes a strong induction of uh, glycolytic enzyme, uh, lactate dehydrogenase, and knocking down MAP13 dampens this uh, induction, 
by almost half. You can see the uh, Western blot here. So uh, now that we see that uh, glycolysis is affected, we decided to look at uh, another source of energy production in, uh, in neurons, uh, the mitochondria. So here we are expressing uh, GFP in mitochondria to look at my, uh, mitochondria morphology in the photoreceptor neurons. The photoreceptor uh, forms synapses in the lamina uh, in flies in a highly uh, organized way because of the flies have compound eyes. So what you are seeing here are the synapses organized in parallel to each other. And correspondingly, you are seeing uh, mitochondria uh, form, forming filamentous uh, array in those uh, synapses. Uh, that's when no alpha synuclein is expressed. But when alpha synuclein is expressed, uh, those mitochondria becomes fragmented. Uh, this is uh, something that uh, has been reported uh, in many other systems too. So uh, this is not surprising. So, But we wanted to know what happens uh, when both mitochondria and glycolysis is affected. So we put uh, forward this hypothesis. So when you have alpha synuclein expression, uh, there's a fragmentation of mitochondria, uh, we predict that um, uh, ATP from mitochondria will be uh, uh, decrease. And also at the same time, we predict that uh, mitochondrial uh, oxidative stress would increase in the form of uh, H2O2 that can be measured. And we also predict that uh, uh, because we see uh, enhancement of uh, lactate dehydrogenase and other glycolytic enzyme, we also predict that ATP from glycolysis would increase. And we also predict that uh, because ATP contributes towards uh, de novo uh, glutathione synthesis. We predict that uh, glutathione oxidative ratio uh, should be maintained. So we set off to uh, test these three uh, predictions. So the, predict uh, the first prediction is whether H2O2 increase in uh, mitochondria uh, in alpha synuclein expression so here we have uh, alpha synuclein expression in the presence of uh, MAT13 knockdown, alpha synuclein expression alone, and no alpha synuclein uh, and no alpha uh, MAT13 knockdown and MAT13 knockdown alone. So what we are seeing is from day seven flies uh, to day fourteen flies, there is an increase in the ratio of uh, of this. Uh, uh, this ratio metric uh, GRP sensor of H2O2. So in this sensor, an increase in ratio indicates increase in level of H2O2 levels. So what happens is, uh, as long as you have alpha synuclein expression, you have increase in H2O2 regardless of whether uh, we knock down uh, MET13. So let's on move, to, uh, move on to the next uh, prediction we made. Uh, we predicted that uh, expression of a uh, glycolytic enzyme and therefore uh, ex expression of MAT13 is important uh, for maintaining uh, ATP level. So we are using a FRET sensor uh, of uh, ATP. And here again, increase in this ratio means there's higher ATP, decrease means uh, lower ATP. So uh, with MAT13 knockdown without uh, alpha significant expression, there is a slight but not significant uh, uh, decrease in ATP. With alpha synuclein expression alone, there's a slight but not significant increase in ATP compared to the control. And with a combination of alpha synuclein expression and MAT13 knockdown, there is a significant decrease in ATP compared to the control. So now we see increase in uh, H2O2 and the decrease in ATP when we have a combination of alpha synuclein and MAT13 knockdown. So what happens to uh, the oxidized uh, glutathione to reduce uh, glutathione ratio, GSSG and GSH. So this is uh, another uh, ratio metric uh, sensor of uh, oxidized to reduce uh, glutathione, where increase means uh, increase in oxidation. 
So in this situation, what we are seeing is uh, from day seven to day 14, we see a divergence of the genotypes where only the combination with alpha synuclein and overexpression and MAT13 knockdown get an increase in uh, oxidation of glutathione, whereas uh, the other ones stay low. So uh, we then decide to uh, look at uh, whether glycolysis can protect neurons because we, are, uh, we have seen an increase in expression of glycolytic enzymes. So, uh, so we did the same uh, sort of uh, experimental setup with uh, combinations of um, alpha synuclein expression and methotin uh, knockdown. Uh, but in addition to that, we express uh, one glycolytic enzyme, uh, PGI. So what we are seeing here is alpha synuclein alone uh, cause some uh, neurodegeneration and alpha synuclein plus MAT13 knockdown uh, cause a lot more neurodegeneration. And this can be rescued by overexpressing uh, PGI, which uh, is one of the glycolytic enzyme. And when we look at the GSSG to GSH ratio in these uh, genotypes, what we are seeing is uh, overexpression of PI uh, also rescue the ratio back to a more normalized uh, state. So this suggests that the ATP coming from uh, glycolysis is feeding into the uh, de novo synthesis of uh, glutathione. Uh, in the interest of time, I shall uh, summarize uh, some of our findings uh, in, in this diagram. So we, the, it is known that uh, the MAT13 uh, containing complex uh, in the mediator core complex uh, interacts with hypoxia inducible factors to mediate the transcription of uh, glycolytic enzyme. So we, uh, we want to see whether the HIF pathway is required in fly neurons uh, for neural protection. And we did a knockdown of uh, HIF in flies. And the answer is yes, it is required for neural protection. And, and then we ask the next question is, is this uh, HIF pathway druggable in flies? So uh, HIF is known uh, to, as mentioned, HIF is known to interact with the mediator complex to mediate transcription of uh, glycolytic enzyme genes. But uh, at the baseline level, it is being constitutively degraded through a process that in, uh, involves hydroxylation and ubiquitination and then uh, uh, proteasome degradation. So, uh, the hydroxylase uh, that uh, hydroxylate uh, proline residues on HIF requires uh, iron as a cofactor. And deferoxamine, DFO, is a known uh, drug that uh, uh, prevents this uh, hydroxylation through sequestration of iron. So we tested deferoxamine on uh, fly neurons. In this case, instead of uh, measuring holes in the, red, uh, in the lamina, we decided to count uh, dopaminergic neurons uh, in a cluster that uh, is responsible for the climbing behavior. So uh, this cluster of uh, dopaminergic neurons uh, is known to undergo age-dependent decline. Uh, and we were comparing uh, method knockdown alone uh, with uh, the control uh, flies there was no uh, uh, relative decline compared to the control. However, when we overexpressed uh, alpha synuclein, there is a significant uh, decline relative control. And this can be rescued by uh, having the flies uh, fed uh, DFO. Uh, and, and this level is, uh, is essentially not different from the control. So when we combine alpha synuclein expression and method in lockdown, uh, we have uh, a more severe decline in numbers, and this cannot be rescued by DFO. This indicates that the, the rescue of uh, neurodegeneration by DFO is dependent on uh, methotin uh, expression. Then uh, we wanted to ask whether this uh, cascade of uh, neuroprotection uh, 
is conserved in mice. Here we got our collaborators in uh, Zhejiang University, uh, uh, Yang Ying and uh, Jing Zhang. So they uh, looked at uh, uh, transgenic mice overexpressing uh, human uh, alpha synuclein, uh, the A53T uh, uh, mutant, and compare that with non-transgenic uh, mice. And they showed that uh, for MAC13, uh, PGI, uh, PGK, and LDH uh, all showed uh, increase in expression in response to alpha synuclein expression in both uh, cortex and uh, midbrain. So this is, uh, uh, in, uh, we didn't show that we also saw uh, an increase in expression of MAC13 in flies too. So uh, then they did an uh, experiment where they knocked down MAC13 in the left side of the substantial nigra in the uh, mouse brain using uh, AAV virus. Here, what they show is uh, by measuring LDH level in uh, dopaminergic neurons in the substantial nigra, what they see is when you knock down uh, MAT13, uh, compared to the uh, comparing the injected and the non injected site, uh, there is a decrease in uh, LDH expression, whereas uh, injection of the control virus uh, in the transgenic uh, mice, uh, there's no difference. Uh, you don't see any uh, significant difference in the non transgenic mice that where alpha synuclein is not expressed. Then they did uh, count the number of uh, dopaminergic neurons in, the, uh, in these mice. So on the injected side, you have a lower number of uh, dopaminergic neurons compared to the non injected side. And when this difference is not seen when you inject uh, the control virus and also it's not seen in the uh, non-transgenic uh, mouse. And here I'd like to thank uh, our, my team uh, in TRL, the, uh, the flight team, and our collaborators, uh, Yang Ying Jing Zhang, uh, Kaliang, and uh, Srinivas, and funding uh, from NRF and uh, Thomasic Life Sciences. And I'll be happy to take any question. Great, thanks, Tongwei. Open for questions. So is your model that it's levels of ATP that are important for um, protecting against alpha synuclein or something else? Uh, yes, uh, in, in our model, we think that the level of ATP is important uh, to uh, uh, did you ask whether it's affecting alpha synuclein level? No. Is it? Does it all come down to ATP levels? Which, which it makes the if you increase ATP levels, does that make neurons more resilient to alpha synuclein? Or if you yeah, lower... I think it's, yeah, I think it's uh, one of the important uh, factors, and I think uh, the ATP is feeding into uh, glutathione synthesis. Uh, our, our reviewers did ask whether uh, uh, in various scenarios uh, this process uh, affects uh, alpha synuclein level, but uh, the answer is no in both uh, flies and mice. And why did you pick um, PGI? Have, did you try other, other glycolytic enzymes? Yeah, uh, we did try uh, PFK uh, in in this kind of experiment, it also rescued the uh, neural degeneration. And we picked PGI because it was previously uh, shown to be uh, protective against uh, alpha synuclein models in both uh, flies and worms. Got it. Have you tried it in any other mouse models of Parkinson's disease or even like uh, six hydroxy dopamine lesions or anything like that? Uh, no, no, we didn't. And do we know what the GWAS, do we know more about the GWAS signal near uh, MED13? 
uh, the there is EQTL data uh, that is consistent uh, that with uh, methotin being uh, the the gene that is uh, underlying this uh, locus. So those SNPs decrease expression of methotin. Is that what you're getting at? Uh, I think so, but uh, I'm not really good at uh, interpreting those uh, okay. data. Okay. Other questions? What about other um, hits from your screen? Anything of interest? Any, uh, so, so this one, CDC27, is also uh, close to PDGR SNPs. Uh, and we have several genes that uh, have roles in uh, mitochondria uh, regulation. Hmm. And those are likely uh, candidates. Cool. And, and there are some that are already uh, implicated in neurodegenerative diseases, like uh, this one and uh, this one. Yeah, the mitochondria ones tend to be important for neurodegeneration. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. Okay, any other questions? Okay, if not, thanks so much, Tongwei. Exciting findings. And thanks, Hal, for an awesome talk. Congrats on the paper. Thanks so much. Um, so, thank you for inviting. I you guys have a great holiday break. Yeah, everyone, rest up. Um, we'll be back in the new year. Any final words, Tsong? Yeah, um, great. Everyone has a, a great a holiday season. It's a great uh, 2023. Yeah. Everyone, Thank you for inviting. Happy holiday. Yeah, as always. Great. See you, Tsong. <laughs>